You and your team created the active diff system for the 14B with the advent of all the additional hydraulic pumps, etc., that were now on the car. Yeah. It was all part of a package. And that was a supremely successful, technically advanced racing car, potentially the most technically advanced of all time, given the regulation changes that have happened since then. To the point where Ernie Eccleston is going through the paddock at Hockenheim with a one sheet of paper list of all the technology that basically Williams and to some extent Ferrari have created, which he wants banned for 94 because it's too expensive or too this or too that. But the one thing that slips through his fingers, maybe because he didn't know about it, I can't imagine it's because he thought it through, <laughs> was active diffs. And, and so that's a reality, first point. And secondly, the active diffs on the Formula One cars today, still very much the system that you created in 91, 92. Yeah, um, absolutely, they are. Um, I mean, subsequent to Williams, I worked at Ferrari for three years, then McLaren from 2002. And uh, yeah, each team, after I left from Williams and, and, and arrived there, had a, a pretty comparable system. Um, we'd had limited slip diffs, like road cars, performance road cars had had for years with plates, with um, uh, uh, the ability to lock depending on the torque across the axle and difference in, in speeds across the axle, Salisbury type locking diffs, which people will have heard of and, and various others, all sorts, Torsen diffs. Um, Wiseman. Yeah, but the, but the real desire was to be able to generate a locking profile based on differential wheel speed, based on angle of the corner, based on applied power. And, and be able to choose anything you like. So to design a mechanical system that can achieve that is, 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 is practically Im impossible, or it would be huge and heavy and, uh, and impractical. So uh, the interest that we then took forward was to, was to use a, a, um, a differential with still with friction plates, like the conventional passive, so-called passive, diffs had, but to be able to vary the clamping force on those plates by a schedule uh, commanded by the onboard computer of the car. And so that's exactly what we did. We, um, we took the differential assembly, which the, uh, the gearbox at the time was a transverse gearbox with a simple spur gear, so a small gear and a big gear driving the, the axle with uh, a set of um, bevel gears, or in this case, epicyclic gears. But anyway, that's the way in which you allow the wheels on the left and right hand side to run at different speeds. Mm -hmm. But then when you want to make their speeds converge to stop one wheel, the inside wheel, for example, running away uh, <coughs> uh, because it's the lightly loaded wheel in a corner, so the inside wheel on a corner, then um, you would want to apply a, a, a clamping load across these friction plates these friction plates are effectively linking the left and the right hand wheel and you can progressively apply a locking uh, torque to tie the wheel speeds to be nearer to each other or even the same as each other by locking it fully. So it's a pretty simple system in, uh, in essence because it uh, just required a hydraulic cylinder, an annular hydraulic cylinder to apply the force. It's in a rotating system so it needed some bearings so that the hydraulic cylinder could be stationary and act against a rotating pack um, but we developed that and it was another one of those things that actually in terms of um, the technical difficulty and the cost of the parts um, was was really was really quite low um, the development to get the best out of it is is more challenging but to, to to actually design the fundamental mechanical system that would achieve that was was pretty trivial, or if not trivial, pretty uh, well within our capabilities, given the other stuff we had already done with the gearbox and we're doing with the active ride. Give so us an idea of it was the very size good value. of your design team at that time, who you were working with and, and the components involved. Yeah, we were probably then somewhere around a, probably a dozen to 18 or so in the main design office, designing everything um, in terms of all the mechanical hardware of the car. So all of the, 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 the chassis, 
um, the suspension, all of the carbon fiber stuff, all of the wings and the bodywork, and then all of the um, rest of the car. So all of the engine installation, all its systems, radiators, cooling systems, and the transmission, um, and all of the hydraulics and so on associated with that. And then you'd have beyond that, I guess that probably didn't include electronics, which was back then, I can't imagine that was more than four or five people. Um, and then aerodynamics and, and so on. But in terms of people designing the main parts of the car, yeah, certainly less than 20. And how many people designing the active diff system? Um, just one man doing that really with some support. That was a colleague with support from us who were doing the main transmission, yeah. And the entire active ride system in terms of the actuators and the hydraulics, you know, that, that, was, that, was, one, that was one person. Um, the thing was in those days, things generally tended to have a bit of a longer lifetime, but, but often no longer than a season. Um, uh, and upgrades to performance and reliability were numerous and often involved drafting in people from other groups in an area where they weren't up against it so much. Williams are then going active in 92 and now you're running the active diff. Did you, from your little department, did you get any feel for what contribution you were making to the lap time <laughs> gain? Um, and what did the drivers say about the active diff anyway? Yeah, oh, well, no, the, the, they, they loved it because they give, it gave uh, an opportunity to really deal with some of the inconsistencies and shortcomings of a regular passive diff. And especially when you're developing things like an active suspension system that can keep a level platform of the, I was going to say the rear end of the car, but the whole of the car. You know, the way the suspension behaves, the way the car can ride the bumps, the way it can deliver its traction changes thanks to the suspension and the control of the contact patch and so on. So the reason to exploit uh, a diff whose, whose locking schedule can be uh, tailored to the speed of the car, to the, to the position of the throttle or the, or, the, or the torque on the axle, to the steering angle, to the yaw angle of the car, to the day of the week or the weather or whatever else, <laughs> those faci that facility, you know, it, it is 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 fantastic. Gold. So, uh, and the thing about the passive diffs, the mechanical diffs, is you could, you'll always be able to improve, or you're always likely to be able to improve a certain characteristic on a certain corner, but because of the limits of the number of dimensions in which you can get the diff to respond, you're likely to have compromised somewhere else. So you're just trying to find. Uh, the least bad, uh, yeah. bad compromise uh, that, that gives you the best lap time. Um, so there's a lot to come out of it. But in those days, our ability to do lap simulation and predict lap time was really, really basic. So stuff like the improvement in lap time due to a gear shift that took not a quarter of a second, but 100 or 90 or 40 milliseconds that was pretty easy to, to work out. Other things like the profile of a, of a diff locking um, system were, were I, I wouldn't pretend, and anybody told you that in those early 90s they could, that they, they successfully calculated that, I think is, is pulling your leg. But the driver, the, the driver and the race engineer could see it on the watch because you could program the diff to replicate what your sad standard mechanical Salisbury diff. With or without track con traction control, when you're negotiating corner and the inside wheel is more lightly loaded, you want to stop it running away. You want to stop it over speeding. Um, and uh, so you would start to lock or maybe completely lock the, the two sides together. Um, but with or without traction, traction control, that is a good thing to do. And in latter years, uh, people have reverted to metallic uh, bronze type facings for their differentials only because of the requirement to get life and multiple races right. uh, out of the But there are quite a lot system. of high performance road cars today with your, let's say your, the Williams active diff system in them. Yeah, yeah. You know, in this showroom there are probably several yeah. carrying that system. Yeah, the, the, the reason really uh, 
for the kind of delay and the trickle down to road car stuff is all about what it costs and whether or not the hydraulic systems can be achieved in, you know, in a cost effective way or in a durable way. The great thing about the racing stuff is, especially in the era where I cut my teeth, is that if something lasted until the end of the race on Sunday afternoon, that was good enough. It didn't mean that we didn't care about things lasting longer. But if you could get an advantage out of designing something that lasted until yeah. maybe five laps beyond a race distance, then that was good. Yeah. In the kind of classic way that people talk about Chapman, you know, I, I'd ideally have my car drop to pieces 100 yards after it crossed the line, which is a bit of an absurd extension of the idea, but the, the principle is, is easy to understand and, and appeals to the engineer who wants to milk a system to the very maximum.